coffee. We are obsessed about making the most delicious cup possible. We seek out the best beans, we buy top quality machines, all for that rare and perfect cup. There are so many factors in a beautiful cup of coffee. It starts with the bean, it moves on to how we roast it, how we grind it, and how we brew it. But there is a secret. How clean is your coffee machine? Every time you make a cup of coffee, it leaves behind an oily residue. That residue can turn bitter and coat the inside of your machine. The key to a great cup of coffee is to remove that residue and start fresh so every cup can taste its best. At Ernex, we've been perfecting that one idea for over 75 years. From my great-grandfather delivering our first coffee urn cleaner to our high-tech quality testing in our labs of today. Our broad portfolio of quality products are designed for the full spectrum of coffee preparation techniques. We're also proud to offer Pura, professional cleaning products for the discerning barista, and Full Circle, the first environmentally responsible and effective portfolio of coffee equipment and cleaning products. We are so proud to have recently moved to our new facility here in Elmsford, New York. Everything's been designed for precision, efficiency, and quality. Right here is where we produce and manufacture everything that we ship to our customers and partners in over 65 countries around the world. In our brew lab, we test our products daily on everything from traditionals to fully automatics, fine-tuning for every conceivable variation. Here at Ernex, you'll find a passionate team of engineers, manufacturers, designers, and coffee lovers striving every day to ensure that every cup tastes its best. Now you know our secret. We work hard to help you make better tasting coffee. Oh, I want to try yours. Incredibly. Oh, by the way, we've got a gift, right? Do we have a gift for the captain really of the spoons? I really want to try yours. All right. um, we're going to get you a gift. Thank close, you very much for your help. Very different taste in espressos. I'll make that you one after. Um, yeah, unless wait. Peter has one. It's there. No, wh which one's Collins? Oh. Uh, no yeah, this one is Collins. So, Raul, you seem to bring out a lot more um, acidity in that shot for me. Yeah. It was a, it was a, lot, a lot brighter. You brought out lots of body, um, lots of kind of bass notes in there. I, I think I okay. I actually like more Collins than mine. No, I, I'm being honest. Um, I think that Collins is more like chocolate and uh, it's, yeah, more, more brown sugar and I don't know. It, I, I go, well, that's the thing that I was telling you. I go, I've been lately going more into light body, light, light body and more into fruits and acidity and just going into that kind of sweetness, but going, you know, for not that, the sweetness, but without that body. Yeah. So maybe, but, but it's just different profiles. And I think that's kind of the things that always when we're doing, we're making espresso, it's like personal preferences and one coffee can have always so much, a lot of profiles that is like amazing about coffee. I don't, I don't know. The concentration was know. very different on those two coffees, I noticed, the ones that I just tasted. It seemed very different, it seemed very, very, uh, uh, like on, on Collins, the, the flavor seemed much more concentrated. The mouthfeel feel was quite different as well. I mean, um, what, what do you think, why do you think that happens with the same coffee, the same machines, the same water, same grinders? Um, it's, well, what I was trying to do with the coffee, I found that like, and I find this with naturals a lot, is that when you stretch them, they, you have to be very careful. There's a line where that acidity suddenly becomes sourness. Right. And, yeah. and I was trying to veer away from that happening. 
Uh, but it's kind of like, in a more controlled environment, I would probably veer more towards what Rao was doing. Right. So I kind of took a safe route, so I was like, because I think like, you sometimes with espresso, it's like, especially with coffees that are like a blend where there's some naturals in there, right. your, your, your margin for error is quite narrow. Right. So I was like, I'm trying to like, uh, play safe a little bit on it. I think it's really interesting that, that out of 16 tasters, you know, we split it right down the middle. <laughs> that I mean, was precisely amazing, right down the middle. Yeah. And I think that says a lot, you know, I think a lot of people, when we talk about the, the, the competition and everything, people get very focused on what the best thing is, but that's an illustration that you can have two versions of excellence that, yeah. that people have a difficulty choosing between. And it's got, like, it's even between, I, I tasted shots in between, and you can still see the variance in between. So, I mean, it's quite interesting that the first, the first shots that came up, Raoul's got lots of boats very quickly on the first couple of shots, but then on the second and third shots, yours were the mo more popular by far. That's espresso. Exactly. Like, um, I was talking to a, a, a guy who runs a shop, like, and uh, he was like, oh, he's making this, and it was really good earlier, and then it, like, then it, like, the sweetness kind of came out, and more floral and city came out, and it started to change a little, and I was looking and going, you've, you've made espresso before, haven't you? Like, it's, that's, that's the game. Like, there yeah. is a, a sense of, like, roulette about it sometimes, especially with, a three bean blend. I was in Moscow last week and a guy, I understood none of the presentation because it was in Russian, but um, he had a hopper for, off a of Malakunik and he filled it with yellow beads, red beads and white beads and he shook it, like the, you know, beads that you'd make a necklace out of, shook it around for ages and then start dosing, just opening the, the hopper and closing it into different bowls and then they counted them out and they're all different. Yeah. So you get like 12 yellows and then four and then right. two and then 20 and then nine and when you consider that in a blend, and what's happening in there is like you're always going to get that variance as well, yeah. which is it's part of the problem, but part of the fun. Right, 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 right. And I think it's it's part of the. I agree. Like, part of the more that you taste, more of the things that I mean, probably the people who are tasting one espresso and then the other one, and it's and it's part of the fun that more of the knowledge that people should taste more and more coffee, like to know more. You know, it's just like. It's like, oh, now I taste this, and now I taste the same thing on the same coffee, and it's just like more interesting. Well, I think the other thing is you've got to take, you know, some people will be tasting more crema, then people will be tasting no crema in the other one because, yeah. that, you know, they were trying a different time. So it, it's, it's really difficult to be, you certainly wouldn't want WBC judged that way, would you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I see, and I think that you see more and more things in competition. I mean, because basically you, it becomes a competition but it becomes one of the things that every single day in a cafe that you just go ahead serve an espresso and like you should taste again another one when people are just like no I'll just have one you know and, and it's just like you should taste another one because it's it will change it will it will be something different I always it, remember it, the light bulb moment where I began to understand wine where it was actually yeah. the wine tasting I was tasting different things and that, that comparativeness of, of tasting beverages you know side by side it teaches you so much about you know yeah. about what, what you're actually tasting there and understanding so so we're going to be doing this again uh with uh two other two new baristas tomorrow um maybe we should have a champion of champions at the end of something but yeah maybe <laughs> that was um, fun actually I, I, i'm wondering <laughs> if anybody from the audience maybe has any questions for uh for the uh the champions here about you know how they uh work their coffee or anything um, you know, this is a this is an unusual kind of instance where people can interact with uh, with uh, with these people who are, you know, legitimate coffee experts. But one thing about coffee is we don't often get the time and are able to take the time to actually interact and talk about things. So, does anybody have any have any questions or observations about about this whole experience? Michael, what did you think about the two coffees? I like the uh, Collins one. Yeah, uh -huh. actually, it was more balanced for me. More balanced, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Uh, How about sweetness? Uh, more balance, more sweetness, and I like the body. Right. And in the rolls, there was too sharp acidity for me. Okay. Ah. It was too sharp. Too much acidity. It, not too Thank much, you. but it was too sharp. You know, yeah. like really hot. Let's talk about acidity a little bit. You know, we, we it's a word that's come up. Um, and that's obviously a word that has a lot of meaning to us coffee professionals, but oftentimes talking to consumers can have a difficult time when you when this word comes up, acidity. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it's 
it's something that uh, we need to be careful that we don't use it as a cop out because I've had instances where someone said, "Oh, this this copy is like it's it's very like acidy and a lot of it's like I don't, I don't really like it." And I'm like, "Well, this is like it's acidity and it makes the coffee complex. So it's something that we prior then by the time I've actually shut up and tasted the coffee, gone." Oh, actually, no, that's under extracted. I'll make you another one. You know? And right, it's right. like, it's yeah. something that I'd, we need to be careful we don't just use as a, a get out clause for under extracted or sour coffee right. or under roasted or anything like that. So it's, they're not the same thing. Right. I think it's really important to start from that sense. Um, but then, like, acidity is uh, it's definitely a challenge for a lot of people. Uh, and I think you probably find that a lot of people I deal with, anyway, are. They, they mix up acidity and bitterness quite a lot. And they right. say, oh, it's very bitter, and they mean it's very uh, acidic. But like things like, um, like, like, like Kenyan coffees or Ethiopian coffees, like washed coffees, uh, I'll always tell the staff in the shop to, to introduce them to people. And you need to help them understand it. Like if they drink them on the right terms, that they can like them. But if they expect it to be a traditional coffee like they've always had, and then they taste it, and it has a floral or a tea-like quality, they'll be like, right. there's something wrong with this. Right. But if you introduce it as say this is going to be, it's not going to have very much body. It's going to be, you know, delicate, and floral, and has lots of acidity. And they go, okay, right. And then they drink it in those terms. It opens up, uh, it opens it up for them. It opens up coffee for them. They see it as a different product altogether. So managing people's expectations with acidity is is very very important. Yeah. In the shop environment, do you find that that's like time consuming and quite difficult to always do that? Yeah. And how do you work around that as a, you know, if you're I busy and there's a queue? Like I think, um, like we have a, like a like a drinking menu and a tasting menu. So you, and the drinking menu, we we always want them to love the coffees, but they'll always be a bit more um, just you know sweet, balanced, delicious coffees that'll just off you go. And then we have the option to for people to kind of veer left and right. So if somebody comes and goes, I just want a coffee, we're not going to give them like a washed yogurt chef. Right. What's uh, the difference between drinking and tasting? How would you define those differences? Well, I think like, I'd say five to 10% of our customers are there to try some, to experience something, to, to, to kind of develop their palate or to try something that they usually wouldn't try. The other 90, 95% of just want a cup of coffee and they, like, they don't want to be challenged. And it's like, you have this in beer, like we were talking earlier, you have session ales and then you right. have your more kind of hop cedric or like sure. a kind of imperial stouts and stuff that you'd, you're not going to drink a whole load of them, but right. every now and again you want to experience them as a little bit different. I think that's important because, yes, we're there to drive specialty coffee and to, and to broaden people's perceptions, but people are on their way to work. People are just meeting their friends, and sometimes they just want a really good coffee. And you know, sometimes I want that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What's your now? Some of the coffees that were in this. This was a three coffee blend. Um, one of the coffee components was was a Kenyan coffee, a washed Kenyan coffee, which is known for having an overwhelmingly powerful acidity. Mm -hmm. Typically, the coffees like that typically have that. Another of the origins was uh, a, uh, a, uh, a honey processed coffee um, from, uh, from Guatemala. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the honey process, Raul, and, uh, and explain how that might have changed the uh, coffee flavor a little bit. Um, well, honey process, it's been like a something that it's been developing a little bit more in Guatemala and I certainly in, in different Central American countries. Um, for me, it's been a couple of two years probably now or, or one year that it's been certainly, um, <clears throat> I use 50% of, of the blend, espresso blends that I use is 50% honey process. And it's, 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 an, it's so interesting to use it in a blend because it's, it gives you so much sweetness and so complex, um, complexity and sweetness and, and balanced tasting body that it gives you still that acidity and that sweetness that it can develop at the same time. I don't know, it's, it's interesting because, yeah. it, it, you know. And to be clear, this is not coffee that's been processed with honey. So, so basically the, the honey, it's, it's just, I mean, it, there's a lot of variances, but for me the honey, it's just basically they pulp it and it's dried with the mucilage. Uh, so it, it, it will contain a little bit more sugar uh, than normally than the wash processed coffee and still will have a little bit more not that clean cup as you will call as a wash processed coffee but still it can be so but I mean it's, it's really interesting how can that develop it's still the, if it's well roasted and the processing as as a you know in the honey process and are there any benefits to the producer for choosing honey process over washed or a natural process well you can have for example if it's uh, a, you have benefits or not, but for example, if 
you dry process uh, as a honey, you can have uh, more time to, you can have more beans. Uh, you can dry it in, in uh, patios or you can dry it on uh, in, in beds. So you can, uh, you can basically have uh, different seasons to have uh, different lots. For example, so you have different lots that you can process them together or separately and uh, you can have more sweetness on the cup. And is there, is there more danger for the producer in, in over-fermenting the coffee in a... Normally they say that, for example, they will have more... There, there's a lot of humidity. Not everyone will can do it because of the humidity or the microclimates that they have in Guatemala. But you, if they, you can control it at the beginning or at the middle of the harvest, you can, you can do it. It's just a matter of the control it and you will have different results. It will not be the same as the pulp naturals of Sambia because of the, you know, the conditions you have different different results, then you will have that kind of flavors that you can have in this, for example, this blend that we had. They will have more brightness, or you have different fruits in there that it will help more into the blend that it just becomes a little more sweet. So, and Colin, you were saying about you, you had some experience of the Shikizu. Yeah. Um, how do you find consumers approach something like a natural processed coffee and the challenges in the coffee shop to bring them along on the journey? It's, 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 uh, it has its advantages and disadvantages. In my experience, it's a, like a naturally processed coffees and, and honey processed to, to a certain extent as well, um, are more stable in terms of the grinder. Right. That you need, you, you need to dial them in less. And there's a, a, there's a because the flavors are so big, there you have a wider window. So like we usually recommend, like um, I don't know if you guys did the same, but we usually recommend that people starting off would, would start with a natural oriented blend. Right and it's kind of like coffee with stabilizers, the very obvious flavors so that, like it's important that you give it, like I have coffees, like we, I did a tasting for a group of home brewers and I showed them the Wash Santa Patrona Pacamara and I said one of these coffees is my, the, my favorite coffee of all time. None of them picked the Pacamara. Right. They all said it was quite bland. Right. And I'm like, are you, like this is so complex and insane. And they all went for the, the kind of one directional kind of natural kind of this is blueberry right you know and then i thought well like when i got interested in beer that's what i was interested in, just like hops bang in your right. face and you get it right and for people when they're starting off in coffee it's very important that they taste coffee and smell it and go strawberries right yes i get this yeah i you remember know? the first time i got a descriptor and it's like wow you yeah. know and we need to give that to the customers. it gives you it gives you um it gives you confidence sure like it really does, and everything follows from that. Like, and uh, uh, for that reason, we always start people off uh, uh, at the start with that. Now, the danger with naturals is that sometimes, if they are, if you're putting them too long or they're under extracted, that especially because well, in Ireland, a lot of people drink like milk drinks are like 60, 70 percent of what we're serving, right? And that has a tendency to come across as sourness sometimes. Yeah. And that could be uh, a little bit of an issue that you have to be careful with. Right. But uh, it's finding that balance is is, is the thing, you know. Um, Customers, again, it's a lot of times like some naturals, like the Indonesian naturals or Brazil, the Brazilian naturals and so central naturals in, in general will be kind of like, you can get away with it, you know, and they're kind of, they're a bit more, let's say, uh, commercially oriented in a sense. But once you get to like an Ethiopian natural, it's, they can just very, very quickly just, you know, drive people away, scare the right. bejeebers out of people, unless and you... And we had, right, yeah. so in this blend we had an Ethiopian natural. It was uh, very pronounced from an area called Shikiso, right, which is, uh, which is near Yirgashev, yeah. which is a very famous, well-known uh, coffee area. Had it pronounced, to me it was a strawberry characteristic, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even in the cup it tasted this, had this uh, strawberry kind of flavor characteristic. And uh, and uh, that can be that can be like your best friend, yeah. or it can be this overpowering yeah. kind of monster thing. It's it's almost what you need to introduce to people all the time, let them know it's there. All of a sudden, advance warning, you know? Yeah, it's true. So but then, I'm sorry, once the, once people, I think, like you say, I think that's very powerful when you can, when there's some characteristic in coffee that is just so pronounced that it's clearly identifiable. That's a that's a strong yeah. feeling for people. And when people get that, they're they're like it's not a a tete a tete anymore. They smell it. They smell right. the strawberry, and they're like, right, yeah, right. And then it's you're with them. You know, yeah. you're you're together in this. Yeah. So they're like, what's next? You know, Absolutely. and it's, it gives people confidence. It's so important. To yeah, them. I agree. So Raul, you not only are a barista, but you're a roaster as well now. Yeah. Roasting for your own company in Guatemala. 
hey, do you do blends? Do you work, do you have any blends in what what you do, or do you only work with single origin? We, we do single origin, and the only blend that we have right now it's the basically the espresso one, um, and we basically because we're trying to try to deliver it something that it's easy to the customers just to just to be easy to drink, yeah. and and that's the reason why we do a fifty percent. Um, palm natural or honey processed coffee and one that it's a wash and we change it that often just to make it you know that kind of experience of a we do a pacamara or we do a, a wuwe tenango that it's just that bright and that kind of acidity that it's just convincing but more like easy to drink you know like I'm more like that kind of espresso that it's not light body and it's just like you don't get bored you know it's just like not one overpowering and it's just like oh I just want to have one you one of you know people don't used to get another one and another one and just not to get bored about it. Okay. I'm always interested and to ask roasters about like, do you post blend or do you pre blend? So do you blend the greens or do you blend the roasted? I, I do the roasting. So uh, it roasting separately and then I just yeah. yeah post. And and what how do you come up with the recipe for the blend? Is it, do you, is it just through tasting or is it through experience? Or? I basically roast. I'm I'm not. I, I think it's more about mistake or anything. So it's just like I roast one coffee like individually and taste it as, as, as for brew, like just cupped it. And if I found something that it's interesting about that coffee, I roast it for espresso and then taste it as espresso single, like a single origin. Then the other one is single. If I found something that is interesting for both, just put them together and then find out how it tastes. And if I found something that it's overpowering the other one, just maybe roast them a little bit different but I always try to make it 50-50, just to make it more always consistent. Not just to put like 70, 30, or 40, because I, I, will, I will normally not, don't do that, because I will, you know, just try to make it 50-50. Right. But, you know. All right. Well, thank yeah. you, Raul Rodas, for the guys. champion from Guatemala, and Colin Norman, Breeze the champion from Ireland. Thank, thank you, you very much. much for joining us. Thank you for having us. It was good. Thank you very much for your signature beverage, and you're going to be performing a signature beverage tomorrow. for us when? Tomorrow? Tomorrow, yeah. I'll be tomorrow. here. You can come okay, see so taste. Uh, 10.30 here tomorrow morning. 10.30 here tomorrow morning. We're going to take a break for another hour, and, uh, and then we'll be back with some more uh, coffee contests and, uh, and talking. So thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you here at 2.30.